Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and I am an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And the program in the Cincinnati area is through the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library under the direction of Brian Powers. And we have today, January the 16th, which also is Martin Luther King Day, uh, 2023, the privilege of interviewing a Vietnam veteran, Leland Irvin McCoy. May I call you Lee? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, and thank you for this interview, and thank you for your service. Yes, sir. Uh, so I said your full name is Leland Irvin McCoy? Yes, sir. And uh, what was your birth name? Richard Allen Stockton. Where were you born as Richard Allen Stockton? Flint, Michigan. Uh, what was your birth date? February 15th, 1947. Uh, your mother and father's names? The, the only ones I knew is the, that uh, uh, my adopted parents was Edmund McCoy and Marjorie Moss McCoy. And when you, uh, when you were born, did you live in, in Michigan? Yes. When you were adopted, did you live in Michigan? Yes. Where did you live when you were adopted? I, we moved out north of Flint, Michigan, about uh, 16 miles of a town called Clio. What were your adoptive parents' names? Marjorie McCoy and Edmund McCoy. And my uh, uh, biological parents was uh, Everett Stockton and Cleta Stockton. Uh, by history, do you know how old you were when you were adopted? About six hours old. Uh, were you born in a hospital? No. Where were you born, at home? At home. And the Flint River was being flooded at the time, and it was they had to take us out by a boat out of the second-story window, I was told. That was in the city of Flint. So you had an exciting birth, huh? I guess. I can't remember. <laughs> so uh, uh, how long did you live uh, with your step-parents uh, going into elementary school? Yes, all the way through high school and through college. Where did you go to elementary school? Clio Elementary, all the way up to high school in and, Clio. And Clio High School? Yes, sir. Did you have natural brothers and sisters or adopted brothers and sisters? I had adopted ones, and I did not know that I was even adopted to 2001. I was the executor of the will, and I opened up the will, and I found my adoption papers. Oh, really? Well, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get so all this, this. All this time, of course, I asked my mother one time, when I adopted, she says, where'd you hear this at? And I said, well, I was just taught. She said, who are you going to believe, them or me? And of course, you don't doubt your mother. Uh, now, was that your adoptive mother? Yes. You? Okay. That's the only mother I really knew. I never did meet my biological mother. What did, uh, what did your adoptive uh, dad do? What kind of work did he do? He worked at General Motors for 47 years where, where? at Buick. In Fisher Body in Flint, Michigan. In Flint? Yes. Do you know what he did, uh, Virginia? He was, he was uh, inside what they call inside trucker. Taking he parts did, from He did assembly for a while. Okay. But he would take parts from one end of the plant to the other end. How about your mom? Did she work outside the home? When they met, my father and mother, when they met, they were both worked at AC spark plug, and that was during the war time. That was, well, it was right after the war because okay. they got married in December 24th of 1946. And she had a previous marriage and he had a previous marriage both. Her first husband was killed in the Normandy invasion. Ah. Uh, was he in the Army then? No, my, yes, he was. He was. But now my dad was in the Navy. He was on the Great Lakes. But he, he wasn't on at that time. Even when World War II broke out, he was out. Okay. Um, it was 23 years difference between my mother and dad. Oh, um, all right. I'm sorry, 15 years difference, not 23. Okay. I'm sorry. So, uh, d did you work at all while you were going to high school? Yes, sir. What kind of work did you do? I worked in a gas station and I worked for farmers. A lot of the farmers we 
got paid so much a day and got a free meal or two meals, depending on what time of the year it was, or whether we had breakfast and lunch, or whether it was lunch and supper. And then I worked in a gas station. We started out, I believe it was a dollar an hour, and we got up to a dollar and a quarter an hour working in a gas station, pumping gas and doing service work. Well, that was back in the days when I would pull in and you would ask me I what you could do. I give you full service. Right. Washed your windows, checked your oil, anything Pump else. The gas. Check your air in the tires, pump your gas. Right. And Far cry from whether, nowadays. Whether you want regular or ethyl. <laughs> nowadays, you pull into the gas station for anybody that's going to be watching this years down the road. You pull in, you got to serve yourself, whatever right. you do. And at that time, they used to have gas wars. Gas was around 14, 15 cents a gallon, and we'd have a gas war, so sometimes it got down to 9 cents a gallon. Wow. This was in 60. Two, three, four, right in there, 62. Well, when <clears throat> when you were in high school, uh, did you work during the school year, just on the weekends or in the summer? Or I worked all during, even during school hours, because I was on what they call a co-op. So I worked at the gas station and worked at, I had to go in and report to school, and I had to give my reports that where I worked at, so they give them to that instructor there at the time, so he could take and evaluate me and I had to do homework and stuff like that and the guy that did uh, who I worked for, he always made sure we did our homework at the gas station. All right. He was a retired professor college in Michigan. Oh really? I forgot which college it was, I thought it was uh, uh, Michigan State. Well, um, when, when did you start that? What grade were you in when you started the co-op program? Were you a sophomore or a junior? Was freshman. Freshman? Yeah. So you and did I was that a, all I was a year behind in school, too. I, uh, when I was in fourth grade, I flunked out a year. So I was a year behind everybody. Okay. So all four years of high school, you were in this co-op program. Yes, sir. And Plus, I worked at General Motors the last couple of years. The last year I was in high school, I got to work at General Motors, too. Plus, I worked in the gas station. So you went to school. Yes, sir. Worked at General Motors. Yes, sir. Worked in the gas station. Yes, sir. Now, how many hours a week did you work at General Motors? I worked 40 hours a week at General Motors. What shift did you work? Second shift. After and school? Yes. You go to school in the daytime? I'd go, go to General in the Motors. morning. Just, it, it, I'd go to school in the morning, an hour, maybe two, depending if we had any exams or not. And then, if, and on the weekends is when I worked in the gas station. You were one busy boy. Yes, sir. You didn't have time for sports, did you? What sports? <laughs> Any sports? Well, we we lift weights, and I did play football a couple of years. But okay. So. And I had my driver's license when I was 11 years old. At that time, a legal license. Legal driver's license. I cannot find them, but you had to have them in order to drive any equipment on the road for farmers or anything because of insurance. Well, what kind of equipment did you drive for the farmer? Well, it was either tractors or my dad's old 50 International pickup. Well, what did you do for the farmer when you were working for him? Clean the barns out, throw silage down, or it was planting or bale hay. And when you baled hay, were you driving the tractor or were you lifting yes, sir. the bales? Both. And how much did those bales weigh back in those days? Well, 75 pounds? Between 75 and 80. And how many hours a weekend would you work with a farmer? Daylight to dark. What did you do with the money you earned with all these jobs? Well, I invested some of it, and I bought three school buses, paid cash for them. I had to go cash my checks. And I sold one to my uncle, sold one to my dad, and I traded the other one for a Harley-Davidson Sportster 1952 K-frame. Motorcycle? Yes, sir. And, and you paid for all these vehicles yourself? Yes. Paid cash for all of them. What did you do with the motorcycle? Well, I was always told if you could take and master it, it's time to get rid of it. Well, I thought I could master it, and I wrecked it, and I, and I got rid of it. Did you get hurt? I got, I got a few scars from it. Did you get hurt? So you got hurt? Just a little bit. Uh, My pride, mostly. Tell me about the accident. It was just a one vehicle. Did you just go off the road or just what? Just by myself. I was taking off in loose gravel, and the motorcycle had they, what they call a suicide clutch. 
Well, I was taking off and it didn't go, so I gave it more throttle and of course then the gravel it took off and then when I hit dry pavement, Pretend. down I went and down I went. Okay. And did anybody come to help you or were you able no. to get back on the bike? Or I just looked you? around to make sure nobody saw me and got on it and tried to get it back home, but the chain had been broke, so I had to push it back home. <laughs> how far were you from home? About a half a mile. So how soon did you sell it after that event? About two months. I traded. You traded for what? It was a 52 International pickup truck. And I used the parts off that for dads. Okay. So you used the parts from the one you bought to fix up your dad's pickup truck? Yeah. And did dad give you his pickup truck? More or less, but it was still in his name. Okay, but you drove it? Yes, sir. I would drive it to school and the girls were riding the cab and the guys riding the back end going to school. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you didn't have to have seat belts, you know. Oh, sure, sure. And when I did the two, put the two together, it, the one that my dad had was a half ton pickup, which was a three speed on the column. And when I got the other one, it was a three quarter ton. So I took the four speed transmission, put in the half ton, and then I put the big rear axle underneath the back end. And that way I could pull grain bed trailers with that pickup instead of a tractor. And lots of girls? Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Did you have a girlfriend in, grade, in high school? Kinda. Uh, then but she not from the same school though. She was from a different school. Well, how'd you meet her? Through my uncle at church. All right. Where where was she from? Beecher, which is just outside of Flint. So uh, was this a steady girlfriend or just off and on? Off and on. Okay. So I think you told me before we started that you also had uh, some college education. Yes, sir. Uh, when did you start college? 1965 through 1966, 67, 67. So is that, is that right after high school? Yes, sir. What, what moved, college did you go to? At that time, it was called Junior College for Eastern Michigan University. Where was that they, located? They, it, right in Flint. It okay. was a division from Eastern Michigan University. It was a junior college. Now I believe they call it Mott College. Mott, M-O-T-T? -T? Yes, sir. Uh, the main campus was that uh, in Ypsilanti. Yes. But you had you had a branch college. Right. All right. And I took automotive technician of it. Okay. Did you work also while you were going to college? Yes, I worked third shift at Chevrolet at that time. I went from Fisher Body Buick to Chevrolet out at Swartz Creek, south of Flint, where it was a parts thing, and I worked third shift as a janitor there. So when you when you worked uh, and for forty hours, I brought home fifty nine dollars. Forty after, hours after takeout. And after, did they take anything out for savings, or was that just no, the taxes and that stuff? No, it was all taxes and stuff at the time. So when you were in high school, uh, what did you do for the automotive company? I was an uh, assembler. I helped put tailgates on station wagon, BH station wagons, and deck lids. And I used to lead in between the uh, roof line and the quarter panel. That would be on your Buicks, like the Wildcat, the Electus. Well, I don't think the Electra was out at that time. But. And you, you did that 40 hours a week? Yes, sir. Eight hours yeah, a I day? Would, I would switch around on different jobs depending sure. on who didn't come in. But you, you're way. working at the, at the plant? Yes, sir. Five days a week, eight yes, hours a day? Yes, sir. Going to school and working for the farmer? Yes, sir. So, what interrupted your college education? Well, I think my wife. And what's her name? Barbara McCoy. And where did Barbara you meet? Bar Wilcox. What was her maiden name? Wilcox. She was from Franklin, Ohio. Well, how did you meet her? Her, her in sister, Michigan, and she she's was, in Franklin. Her, she was adopted, and her family was all adopted out. And her one sister was adopted to a family up in Michigan. And my first cousin was marrying her sister. I was best man and she was bridesmaid. That was in August of 66. <laughs> so, all right, so you're part of the wedding and then pretty soon you're getting in the wedding. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, when, when, did, when, did you, you, when did you two get married? Uh, right after boot camp, June 7th, 1969, here in, 
in Carlisle, Ohio. Well, were you drafted or did you enlist? Yes. I was. I got that letter that said, greetings, your friends and countrymen has invited you to the United States Armed Forces. So oh, I had to go all the way back to Michigan because that's where my draft board was from. Well, we're missing some things here. You get out of high school and did you meet her right after high school? Yes. All right, you met her and then take me from there up to the time you got drafted. Okay, I kept getting laid off at GM up there. So, and I was going with my wife at the time, so I was coming back and forth from Flint to Ohio all the time. Finally, I just moved down here and I was working at some of the dealerships around here as a mechanic. And then uh, I also joined the volunteer fire department at the time, which her dad was over and some of the other guys that I knew was over, but they worked at Frigidaire. Now, uh, and this is in Franklin, Ohio. Yes. And he, he lived in Franklin and drove up to Dayton, Frigidaire? Yes, sir. All right. And they said, well, Frigidaire's hiring. How would you like to have a job? And I said, sure. So, well, it cost me a steak dinner, and I went up there on the 20th of December of 68. Started working for him full time. Doing what? I was assembler. What were you assembling? Uh, refrigerators, the evaporators up in the top. And I got 91 days in, so my time had started to scope, plus all my time from Flint came down here too. Showed that my time came on when I got my letter for Uncle Sam. So while I was in the service, all my GM time went on. Okay. So uh, when you got your letter, uh, where did you go to, uh, to enlist? Uh, we had to go to Fort Wayne, Detroit. It's an old army base there. How did Detroit. you get there? Well, I drove up there the first time for the physical, but then the second time I took a bus. Longest 10 hours I ever been. From Franklin to Fort Wayne was 10 hours? Well, it went right to Flint and then I got, uh, my dad picked me up from there and then took me back down to Detroit. Oh. So where, where, uh, where'd you go for boot camp? Fort Knox, Kentucky. How long were you in boot camp? Eight, six weeks. Now, you're drafted into the Army, right? Yes. And you're six weeks down at uh, Fort Knox? Yes, sir. What did you do in boot camp? What kind of training did you have? Well, when I got there, they, they knew that I was interested in different stuff like uh, maintenance or science, like uh, forensic stuff, they call it now. So after they got done with that, they said, well, we might ship you out someplace else or whatever. And I said, well, I'm light and get married. Can I go home first? Well, they're going to give me a couple of weeks to come home. Well, but I had all the training. I had to run the miles and everything. You had to run it in so many minutes per mile. Of course, that wasn't as big as I am now. And I had a little longer legs then, too, so I could run a little faster. <laughs> and, uh, but we had our training with our rifles. We had training with our firearms. And the, there was three of us. We all, first three shots we took was all within a silver dollar. So they took us down range to another place and we all looked at each other and we knew what was going to go on. So when we got down to the other and they gave us other rifles to shoot with, we, did, we couldn't hit the targets. So they put us back in with the rest because <laughs> we knew they were going to send us to sniper school. We okay. didn't want that. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you if you got a marksman in that medal, but, but you avoided that. Kind of. <clears throat> so. So where did they send you after you flunked out of the, this other range? <laughs> after we got done with boot camp, I came home, got married, and I had orders to go to uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, and Colorado Springs, Colorado. And what did you do at Fort Carson? Well, they got me here at Fort Carson, and they said, you're going to be stationed up at Norhead. Now, what's Norhead? Norhead is the place where all of your rockets and stuff and uh, missiles and stuff is in the side of the mountain. And, it's and it was located where? In, just up on the mountain of Pikes Peak. Okay. So you went up there for assignment? Yes, sir. What? I had to go up there. I had to report every night. I was in third shift for a while, and then they put me back on day turn. What did you do up at Norway? Patrol. So how did you patrol? On foot or vehicle? Both. At nighttime, we was in vehicles, and in between, we was in between two eight-foot high with Constantine wire uh, road, on each side of us, about it was probably 12 foot wide, but it was 
one way road, you know. Yeah. So when you had to patrol it, and you was always behind another person, so you could see the headlights or taillights from the other person from behind you. You wasn't that far behind, and that's the way we patrolled. Okay. And got back in. Well, then they gave me a clearance, seven clearance. I could tell you what was on the first doors of the Norhead, but nothing else after that. Okay. That's all I know of what was in Norhead. Did you ever have any problems when you're out on patrol? No. Jackrabbits getting away. Uh huh. So how long did you do that, Lee? Uh, three months. What, what was your uh, What was your rank at that time? Uh, e three. And what is that? Uh, at that time, it was a, a PFC. Okay, private first class. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, when you left Norad, were you on the same uh, same E three? No. When they gave me my orders to go, they made me up to an E four specialist. All right. Where did Where did they send you from Norad? Vietnam. Did you have a just chance to come just home? Before, just before I got ready to come home from Colorado to here to go to Vietnam, I brought my wife out there with me. Out to Colorado? Yes. So she wasn't there very long with, we wasn't there very long together. About how long? Weeks or months? A couple of few months. Okay. Where did you live? We lived downtown in town and I met one of the gentlemen who was a retired sergeant and he had a gas station and he let me work in that gas station and I got the rent free and I kept the grass cut and everything, and that's where we lived at. And we had the basement of this house all by ourselves. <laughs> so we had a, a whole room by ourselves, and we had the shower. We had everything where we didn't have to share it to nobody else. And we lived at 16 North Weber Street. You were really a workaholic, weren't you? Well, when I worked at GM, I was 16 hours a day, seven days a week when I came home. Man. Most of the time. I, I didn't want to stop. I did. so when I came home, there was too much going on. So uh, you get your orders to go to Vietnam. Did they let you, uh, did you and your wife come home? Yes. And she stayed here? Yes, she stayed with her parents. And how long did uh, were you able to stay home before you actually had to start out for the Vietnam? Next week. That, just a week? Yeah, well it was two weeks and then I got to go. All right. So it actually was about a week the time we got, back home and got ready to leave again. It was about a week that we was together. Where did you leave from? Franklin? Yes. And how did I, you? I actually flew out of Dayton, I'm sorry. You flew, flew out, out of Dayton. Dayton. Was that a to, commercial or was that yes, a commercial? Military? I had to buy it because I had to report to Oakland, California. At your own expense? At my expense. What kind of a plane was it? It was a 727 going into Chicago and then it, uh, I think it was a 747 from there into San Francisco, I believe it was. And those were those jets or prop planes? Jets. Um, I kind of lost interest in airplanes when they <laughs> went to jets. I loved the old prop planes. Uh, so you go from uh, Chicago to where? San Francisco. I had to report into Oakland, California, just outside of San Francisco there. All right. And uh, I reported there a day that I was supposed to to leave. I reported, I reported in that morning and they gave me that day off until that evening. They said you might as well go out and see some of the sites. So a bunch of us, we got a taxi cab and we rode around town, a bunch of us guys did. And then we came back and then they had our orders ready for us to go to Vietnam. So then they took us out to the air base and I know it was a jet, but don't ask me what it was because I can't remember. It was too much going on. Was we that left. commercial again? Yes, that was commercial. And we went into Anchorage, Alaska. Well, uh, when, when you left California, were you with any of the guys that you had made friends with through training and different no. assignments? No. All, right. all the ones I made with boot camp and everything, there was nobody that was ever with me because they all went either Fort Polk down in Louisiana and they went to Vietnam and I went on a different way because I was supposed to go in. Since I had my clearance, they were going to send me into a forensics at that time they they didn't call it forensics but a science which ended up being uh, CID which is you know criminal investigation department okay so where did you land in Vietnam right in Saigon outside of Saigon at uh, Long Ben jail where's our map uh, in let's, let's, let's take a break a minute Early. 
I flew in down here to Saigon at LBJ, which is Long Bend Jail. All right. And that's where a lot of your military police and everything was at. And of course, when I was with... Uh, well, how long were you down there? Two nights, maybe. Okay, then where did you go? I went way up to Chulai. And I was right there where that peninsula is, and I was with Colonel Schwarzkopf. And uh, what did you do up there? I was supposed to watch and see and watch where they, how they demand old man minefields and stuff that was planted there during World War II and stuff. Now, he had a, a, a bond with his people. I don't care if they were black or white, he had a bond with them. He would sacrifice his life even for them. And he had a, a good relationship with all of his Italian people. And everybody liked him? Everybody liked him. And he was a very nice guy. And of course, that's when he was just a full bird colonel at the time when I was there. Uh huh. When I met him. And, and are uh, you an E4 at that time? Yes. So then there was a, a helicopter pilot came in. He was a W3. Well, he come in and he said he was looking for me. And come find out it was my first cousin's husband. And he was a warrant officer and he, he says and got to talking to me and everything. And, I, and of course I knew him and everything. He was from Flint, Michigan. So it was my cousin's husband is what it was. Okay. And he was, he was a real nice guy. But he was a chopper pilot and this was his third tour and they made him a W3 warrant officer. So he says, well, you don't want to be down here. So he said something to somebody, and I don't know what happened. Next thing I know, I'm on the north end of the base there at Chu Lai, investigating where a hand grenade got put into a captain's bunk bed. A live hand grenade? Live hand grenade, and it got blowed up. So I went undercover in this maintenance unit, which was the, I think it was the 169th unit, maintenance unit, battalion unit, and it's Delta Company. And... Nobody knew what I was. They didn't. They just thought I was just another soldier coming in there and everything. But the funniest part of it was they had a cook there they called Sid because they thought he was uh, undercover, you know, a, a uh -huh. CID guy. Well, he was just a military police. So here I am. I am the one from there and trying to find out what's going on and who did it and all this and everything else. So it, it was kind of funny. They called him Sid because they thought he was the one that was undercover, and all the time it was me, so it was the way it was, you know, and everything. So it was kind of funny. Well, then I was up for E5. I was there about a month, and we got all the pepper work done and everything, and I was up for E5. Well, when I went in for E5, when I walked in, a couple of people recognized me from the unit down at the other place, and they said, uh, what are you doing up here? I said, I'm doing this, and this, and this, and this, you know, and different things, you know. And they says, well, we're going to make you a W-2. A warrant officer, too? Yes, sir. So I left there as a W-2, and they sent me way up at Da Nang with the Marine Corps. Now, where's the Da Nang? Da Nang was, uh, let's see, here's Chu Lai. Da Nang right here. It's about 60 miles north of Chu Lai. And that's where I sat there in Da Nang for a while. And... They made me a W-2, and then they put me over to one side over there, and they says, uh, we want you to watch these ships. So I'm sitting out there watching these ships where stuff's coming in off the dock, off the big ships coming in to the other little boats that's coming in, I sure. call them flat bottoms and stuff, and I'm supposed to watch what's coming off and on them. Well, I'm watching what's coming off and on, but I turned around and I looked on the back side. There was more going off on the back side than there was the front side because of the black market. Uh -huh. And this is what I was supposed to be reporting, see. Well, <clears throat> come find out, I wasn't supposed to see that. <laughs> so they transferred me from there over to where the, ba the uh, air base is, there at Da Nang, and right at the end of the runway is a morgue, mortician and stuff. So that's where I was for body count and sorter. Oh, wow. And that's what I did then, and they put me back as an E-5 then. And now, um, we'll talk about some of these other things. Okay. But what else? Where else were you besides South Vietnam? Were you in Laos at all? Yes, we had to go over to Laos. Laos, we had to go over and pick up evac unit and bodies. We had to bring bodies back. And were you in, in uh, Cambodia? Cambodia, at all? yes. When we was when we was in Da Nang, we had to shack town, what they call shack town, go from one place to another and go back. And they would have them ready and have them bagged for us to bring back so we could get them ready to put them in the caskets, seal them, and put them on the planes to come home in the silver caskets. 
So what did you do in, in uh, Cambodia? Cambodia, we just went across the line and picked up what was the wounded and More. stuff there. Sometimes we picked up some wounded and brought back too. Now it, it sounds cruel, but a lot of times we use their bodies for a defense. Is that you? You know what I'm getting at? Yeah. Because when I sit on the that helicopter, I'd have my feet out, and you have a tagline. We always took our flight jackets off and sat on them. The pilot and the co-pilot, they had armor plate underneath them, but we didn't have nothing. So we sat on them. Well, a lot of times when we come into a fire, when we come into an LZ, it was supposed to be in a cold LZ, none of them was ever cold. And an LZ means what? Landing zone. All right. And so we'd have fire come in. Well, what I had was what they call a swinger gun, a weapon. An M60, well, we said we could load and unload. Yes. That's, that's one of them there. That's, that's me there. And so that's where we, after we pick stuff up and everything. Okay. So what kind of a, uh, a gun is that that you're... That one there they call a greaser. That's a 50 caliber. Did you fire that any? Yes, sir. What? Tell me about instances when you would be up. You're, you're up here in the helicopter and you're you're protecting yourself. Where are you? You're going into these LZs. I'm, I'm in an open door. And you're going into an LZ. Yes. And they're shooting up at us. Now that one there is on, like I said, on the Jolly Green Giant, the big helicopter. And the other one that I had the 60s on, that was in a Huey helicopter. Because that's where I ended up being with was the Hueys afterwards. But when we had the big big boys, when we go over to Laos and stuff, so we could put more on because they were like a troop carrier, but we had more bodies to carry on it. And we always had to make sure them bodies and everything was there. I think you may have a picture of one there. There you go. That's what they call it. We used to call them shit hooks. But they're actually a Chinook. Okay. 46 and 47. Holding up just a hair. Oh, excellent. I got a good picture of him. So that's the one that you take over to Laos and Cambodia? Yes. Mm -hmm. How many, how many uh, soldiers could you get on there? Well, at that time, you could put a whole platoon on there, a whole company. Well, how many is that? It depended. At that time, what was the average? Sixty people, plus the crew. How many were in the crew? You and who else? There'd only be uh, eight of us mostly. Pilot, then, a pilot, co-pilot, yourself, and the other. The loadmaster, and then three other people, right. plus two gunners. Right, well, two other gunners besides me. Besides you? Yeah. And did they have the same type of equipment? No. What were they shooting? I was on the back. The back had 50 calibers, on the front had 60 calibers. Um, and you call them a swinger because, first of all, they're too heavy to hold. Right, and they hang on a cable, so you can turn them left to right, you know, back and forth, and you can point them up and down. And the 50 caliber, a lot of times you could hold them because it was, you could go up, but it would lock. It depended on how long, if, if the gentleman before me might have been taller, he may have a shorter cable, so I'd have to really get up there, but mine had to be low because he was a shorter person before I was, so I could bring it down and hold it at my waist. Well, how many times did you have to uh, go into these hot LZs? Every time we went out. And I would say all the times I was over there, probably 60 sometimes in a, Three months, Six, maybe less. Uh, how many times did you take fire when you went into these? Every high? time. Did you ever get wounded? Yes, sir. And how many times were you wounded? Twice. Where, where were you wounded? What part of your body? The bottom of my legs, from the waist down, my strotum, and down a little bit my arms, but not too much. Don't know if it was real bullets, but it was shrapnel. One was a bullet, but. Uh, tell me about the shrapnel. Well, It'd either be pieces from the helicopter where the bullet is ricocheted off from. We was coming in one time and we took a sniper fire on the, one of the rotor blades. And you know how you used to open up a sardine can? Yeah. Well, that's what that rotor blade did. Well, the blade stopped and we go. 
and when we was only probably maybe a hundred feet above and when we hit the ground we just took off all everybody was on the helicopter now that was on a Huey now when you say everybody took off everybody everybody that was alive could we all did survive that was alive that one there was only four people that was on that for a crew and you all survived yes we all survived on that one um, but you weren't injured on that one or were well you? I was but I didn't feel it okay the adrenaline's going too much to even feel it because I didn't know and I and of course I wore flight coveralls too you know and uh, I really didn't know it until we got back to our home base and saw the blood. And was that your lower leg? Yes. So they patch you up and send you back out? Yep. I was in the hospital there at the uh, at Da Nang, maybe two hours, playing with, playing and carrying on with the doctors and the nurses like I always do. Uh huh. I know you. <laughs> you know how I am. And. Uh... So then they, they patch you up and uh, you go back to your assignment. Yeah, took me back out to the morgue. Out to the, and it was right at the end of the runway. So the, them C-130s, when they take off, if they missed the runway, they'd be into the morgue. So they didn't have too far to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, how long did you work out of the morgue? Probably, a, well, I had, a, in country, I didn't have as much time, with, but I extended duty to stay over there. But I didn't have to stay all of my time because when I got wounded the second time, that's when I extended. So I came home and I got my wife pregnant and I went back. Okay. So that was 30 days I got to come home for. All right. And went back to the same place. So when you extended, how long did you extend for? I extended for six months. So I wouldn't have to come back and do stateside duty. So when uh, I went back, I was still the same place, but it was, had changed and stuff. Well, well, how did it change? We had some uh, people would kind of come in and wanted to make it stateside. Shoe signed and floors cleaned, mopped and everything, you know, all this and everything, which, you know, it's got to be clean anyway. And we have to, we had to sign for this stuff. You now, uh, the body bags that we had put our, put our bodies into, they all had to be there. Uh, they had to be sealed. We have to sign for them. We put a seal on them. When we put them in the casket, they have to be sealed. Well, let, let, let's go through that slowly. Now, are you actually going out in the helicopter, like when you went to Laos and, and Cambodia, you're actually going out there in the helicopter and you're pick, you and the crew are picking up the bodies? Right. And Sometimes we bring some wounded back. Okay. Just depending on what going on and what action's going on. Right. In Laos and Cambodia it wasn't too much, but in Vietnam there was more. Uh, that's where, let's see, before I get ahead of myself, that's where we was down uh, over by Quezon Marvel Mountain, which is straight west of Da Nang, almost to the Cambodia border, right off, right off in the Mekong Delta River. Okay. And that's where we was at, and that's when we was down in the village there. And we got a few days off there, so we got to horseplay around a little bit, you know, and go down and see the village and see different things. Some of them pictures I showed you where we was at and stuff. And that's where we run into some trouble. And In the village? Yes. What kind of trouble did you get in the we, village? We got into some gunplay, some gunfire. And I, I always carried my forty five and an M79, now, which is a grenade that? launcher. Okay. Or a shotgun. or flare gun, you could use all of them in there. But I always had it for a grenade launcher. And how many guys are with you in the village? There was about four of us together playing around, horsing around, you know, and we're all, and we're not too clean looking. I mean, you know, we've been outside and been in the dirt for a while and crawling around. And uh, that's when this one, they said, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. And I didn't know what they were talking. They were all hollering and carrying. Well, I turned around and there was this boy coming at me and all I could see is he had a coke can in his hand well I knew what to do and didn't know how to do it do it quick enough but I, I still pulled that trigger and uh, there was nothing left of him all I saw was his boot his shoe and his ankle and we found out later that that coke can was a homemade grenade I've read about that uh, yes it was glass and, and black powder 
and and razor blades in it and and spikes and needles and stuff. And, and what, what, what would put. detonate that the cocaine? They'd have a, a, a fusey on it, okay. what they call like a fuse. But they have to get close enough. And a lot of times, us guys, they would get close enough and throw them in our shirts or throw them at the ground at us if we're standing and not see them come in. Oh, man. So that was, as far as seeing any action to know that I had killed anybody, that was the only one that I ever knew that I had to kill. But the rest of it, you, I couldn't tell you. Was was he? Uh, was he, he was a teenager, or was he? He was approximately maybe eight to ten years old, no more than ten. Wow. Now, I've, now back at home base, you know, some of the guys have told me that uh, you might have a, a barber, you might have a cook, yes. and they're and they're working for you in the daytime, trying to kill you at night. Right. Did you have any of those yes. instances? Yes. We had perimeter guard there where we sent was at, and we had to. We all took turns, like KP, you'd have it once a month and don't have to have it for a while, or perimeter guard, and you do it for a while and don't have to do it for a while, you know. So this one Papa son was going out, which is one of the older men that worked there, and we told him to bend over, and he kept saying, no come back, no come back. Now what's that mean? means he doesn't understand. Okay. Well, we bend him over and we kick him in the butt, and out comes a bunch of flashlight batteries. <laughs> And there's what were they going to use those as detonators? Detonators. We've had some where they've had live ammo stuck in their rectums. And the women too, not just men, but women too. And that's why we had to do what we did. We had to do it. Whether it was man or woman, we still had to do it with them. Well, you couldn't tell whether they were friend or foe, could you? Not at that time. They're supposed to have been friend yeah. during the day, but at night you didn't know. Yeah, um, and that's that's the perimeter line there. You can see mm -hmm. the roads that goes up and down through there. Those are tower guards, and then just down in front of them, in that other road in front of them, is nothing but concertine wire and everything along there with it. And one night we had a tiger get into that, and everybody opened fire in that tiger, and I think the tiger was scared more than we were, and he was gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to rain outside. So. Uh, when, were you in one of these? Uh, I was uh, in the 30-foot uh, tower. Uh, and that's the short one? That's the tall one. Tall one. The other ones were either ground or six foot above ground on light poles. And how many would be in the tower at, the same, at once? Three of us on a 24-hour shift. Uh, three at a time? Yes. And what now, kind during of... During the day, a lot of times, one could stay up there and, and stay awake while the other two go down and shower and eat. And then the other one come, the other two, one of them will come back up and do it, and the other one will go up and relieve him. So during the day, we didn't have to be right in the tower as long as there was always one person in there during the day. But at nighttime, all three, there was two bunks in there. It was sandbags around it, about three foot deep all the way around on the back side. Excuse me. And then they had plexiglass for windows because monsoon season comes in. And we had sandbags on top, also. We had an M60 on the on there plus. A, we had uh, an M1 and we had uh, M14s. That's my brother-in-law there at LZ Hawk Hill. That's one of our hoochies that we lived mm -hmm. in. And that sandbags on the roof? That sandbags on the roof. And if you look, it's trenched down along the side too. And I'm up on the top of the roof of the next one to him, that, taking that picture. And is that kind of typical for the area where you were? Where I was at, yes. How long would it take to construct one of those? Well, the Navy come in, the CBs would come in and grade it all out, and they would build the buildings, and then everybody else had to do the sandbags and everything else, and probably two days with everybody doing it in the battalion. You could probably do about four of them in two days. Now, was, was the foundation of this sandbags, or was that uh, concrete, or what was it? All sandbags. All sandbags. Sometimes. On the inside of them, where the hooch is made, the roof comes out three foot past the sidewalls, and up above it, on the on the sidewalls, there'd be a screen there. Well, when you bring them sandbags up, you put 55-gallon barrels along the outside, around the outside, fill them full of sand, and then you put them sandbags on the outside of that and fill them up, but then you left that screen open 
so you get fresh air mm -hmm. in there and but you couldn't see in there but you get fresh air because of the sandbags okay. so it was open to get fresh air through there uh, did you have any night attacks or day attacks at the base not during the day once in a while yes we had rockets come in and come right down on, off in the uh, right on the airstrip in Da Nang. Any close to your hooch? Yeah. Oh yes, yes. It'd be within hundred feet. Okay. And when we was at the morgue, it'd be right there close to it. We'd get out of the morgue and go off into the into a what they call a, a foxhole like with sandbags and stuff in and we'd have it manned with weapons in there also. Did you, did you have any, a, a, I don't want to say major or minor, I don't know what you would have a, a nighttime attack by, by the VC or? When I was there, no. But back in 68 when they had 68 Tet and 67, they had it worse than what I did. I was probably lucky because I had a lot of schoolmates that I was went there before me, and they did not make it home. One gentleman was there, I think, two weeks in in country, and and got killed. Got killed. So uh, let's let's uh, you, you go over into to Laos. Uh, your 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 assignment is to go in there and bring injured troops or or, or bodies back. Bodies right. back. So. Uh, how many helicopters will go in at a time? Usually an eight in a pack, but there would be only two of the big helicopters, and the rest would be gunships. Okay. Did you have any instances Sometimes. where you uh, really had difficulty landing? Sometimes we take in sniper fire, and you couldn't tell, so you just opened up to where you think it's coming from. Uh huh. Whether you hurt the hurt hurt the person, wounded him, or killed him, I don't know. Just trying to protect yourselves right. is what you were doing. So the, the helicopter, in order to load the bodies, you have to actually contact with the ground. Right. And um, Now after we got on the ground where we was loading that, it'd be heavy protected from around that area. By what? By other soldiers in that area that was on that landing zone. Okay. In other words, there'd be a perimeter around through there, so it'd be like a base camp for some of them. Okay. And then when we take off, that's when we take in fire again. So you land, uh, and has anybody got the, does any person have these bodies lined up for you? Or yes. are you going out and picking they, them up? Or? Some of them are not in body bags, but most most generally they are. Okay, some but of them you couldn't. Some of them is just on yeah. the cot. Some of them, we didn't have DNA. Right. So we had to sort them. And then when we got back to the mortuary, we had to really sort them. Okay. In some cases, when they were burnt, stuff like that, you really couldn't tell, and that bothered me a lot. Yeah. Because uh, after I was home, I remember here in Ohio, I forgot where it was at, they buried their son, and the mom and dad passed away, and they were buried. Well, his sister, when they brought our prisoners home, he came home as a prisoner. So it makes you wonder, did we get the right people in the right graves? Yeah. He might have been killed, but was it the right person? We yeah. didn't have DNA then, so yeah. that's why they went back some places sometimes if it's questionable to redo it. Okay. Because you couldn't really... Some of them were yes. just so disfigured you couldn't tell. Right, and some of them was burnt beyond. Yeah, and with the extremities missing and all that, you try to sort those out right. too. Right, right. And did they all have dog tags? Yes. Uh, there was the first one I ever picked up when they took me out on body count. He was an officer. He was a captain. And he must have laid in the hot sun for about four days. Ooh. This is the first body i seen, okay? Now, he was mutilated because they... The VCs would mutilate the bodies? Yes. If you had any gold teeth, they always pulled them out. But if they want you to talk, they tortured you. And that that bothered me. After that, it didn't seem like too much after that bothered uh -huh. me too much. Um, so you, you get them loaded on your, on your helicopter and you bring them back to the mortuary. And uh, 
from there, are you finished, or do you have to do more things in the mortuary yourself? We have to clean them up <coughs> and make sure they, if we can put uniforms on them, if they can get uniforms on them, if whatever. Usually we don't. We just put them in a body bag. Okay. And, and they, what were those like? What were those made out of? Rubber, washable rubber, and some of them was vented, but most of them was not vented. Uh, did you have any... Uh, Refrigeration at the mortuary? It, yes. It wasn't like a freezer, but it was refrigeration because, well, those guys used to sleep in there. In fact, we was there one time, and this major come in, big tall major. He was all stracked from the United States, all spit shine spit and everything, you know. And the clerk was there, and he come in, and he says, I'm Dr. So-and-so from so-and-so, you know. And, 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 of course, the hospital was way over on the other side of the runway down at the other end, you know. And... Uh, We'd go in and we'd have sponge rubber that we could lay on inside the morgue there. So he comes over and he said, what's wrong with this drawer here? And he opened it up and I'm sitting there like this here sleeping. I said, I help you, sir? And he took off and a jet run. <laughs> he was a black person. And when he left, he was white as a ghost when he left. And it was about two or three days later, it came down. There'd be no more sleeping in the mortuary no more. <laughs> But we used to play poker in there, too, on Saturday nights, too. And we used to have some guys come in, and they'd bring a body over, you know, and you'd, you'd hear gases escape here and there. And this one gentleman, we don't know who his name was, don't know where he came from, but when he left, he left $300 on the, picnic ta on the poker table well, and never did come back. <laughs> because why? Because he heard the gases and he saw this body bag moving. <laughs> and we got used to it, you know, a lot uh -huh. of us guys did. And, uh -huh. and sometimes you did. It just depends how it catches you off. Because yeah. every once in a while, you know, you still, even to this day, it bothers me sometimes if I don't, and stuff like that. And I think that's why I worked like I did after well, I came home. At that stage, are you in the Army or are you in the Marines? I was or in the Marine Corps there. When did you get transferred from the Army over into the Marines? When they took me from Chu Lai up to Da Nang. Okay. And when they took me up there, they, that's when they put me with the Jolly Green Giant and stuff that was all Marine Corps. How did you interact with uh, the guys in the Army as opposed to guys in the Marines, or was it all just one big group? We just had like one big group. We, we worked together. We had to. What we did, we had to work together. Whether the Army brought them in or what, we had to work together. And that was just like the Air Force there when they, on the planes, that were bringing the bodies back to the United States. Mm -hmm. We all had to work together. And one gentleman, he's from here in Middletown, he just passed away. He was with our group there for a while, Ed. He was a lieutenant. He used to bring a doctor over all the time. And so I knew him from over there, too. Uh -huh. He was in our group here. And uh, we just had, we had to work together. Yeah. Now, second lieutenants and majors was always my pet peeve. And why was that? Second lieutenants wanted that gold bar out there and be right out on the front line. And you don't do that on the front line. And I told everybody when I first got in, they said they needed trucks, truck drivers. And I said, well, I used to drive trucks, you know. So I volunteered. Well, my truck was one wheel and two handles. It was a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and then on, I didn't volunteer nothing. So second lieutenants, they always want to volunteer for everything. They want to be a full bird without being a captain or a major or anything, and majors want to be a general without being a lieutenant or a colonel. They want to jump right up through the ranks, and they know everything. Uh -huh. So you got to hold them back and say, hey, you don't do that, sir. But now the first lieutenants, they were pretty good, and captains that I worked for under was. And like I said, the first colonel that I ever run into, I respected him right up until he passed away, and that was Colonel Schwarzkopf. Okay. He was the best officer I ever ran into. Now, my captain that I had in, in uh, Da Nang there at the mortuary, I respected him. He was a nice guy. He was a real good guy. He says, anything you need, give me a call. And we didn't see him unless we needed him. Uh-huh. Well, uh, the, guy, the guys in these, uh, in these bases uh, did a lot of them. Uh, kind of uh, not respect the second lieutenants uh, just like you? They d well, were a yes, reticent. because they wanted to be <coughs> gun-ho, if you, want, if you want to put it out right. They wanted to do everything by the book, the way it should be, just if they came out of West Point. Instead and of being out there in the jungle. 
You did, yeah. You, when you're in the jungle, you can't do you things can't by do the book. You can't do that by the book. You got to go by your ear and play by the ear and go what you're going to do and and reconnaissance it's recon that's out there and stuff. There was a lot of gentlemen that came in, and a lot of people they didn't say too much to us guys. We, uh, they called us grave diggers in some places, and they didn't say too much to us guys in there. Would they, res they I don't know if they were afraid to or whether they respected us uh -huh. because that's what we do. Somebody had to do it, you know. And uh, so that's, I don't know if that means anything or not, but I never had no trouble with any of them. Good. Well, let me uh, take you back to uh, when you're out there and uh, you, you're doing this undercover work about the yeah. uh, grenade and the lieutenant's bunk. Uh, did you ever find out uh, yes. what, how that happened? Yes. And uh, was that one of the enlisted fellows or was yes, that a sir. VC guy? No, it was an enlistment. Um, Him and the captain couldn't get along too good. And uh, was this a daytime or nighttime incident? Well, it happened at nighttime. <laughs> okay. When he went in to go to sleep, it was rigged when it blew up when he got in his bed. What happened to the perpetrator? He was sent back to LBJ and I believe he went for court martial and back to the States for murder. Now, is that the only instance that you had to investigate like that? Like that one, yes. Now, I had to investigate, like I said, when I was with Colonel, Colonel Schwarzkopf, uh, of how they did the uh, landmines and how they and how many they have and what they had to do and how they had to go out to do them. They didn't have the stuff like they do now. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have the dogs like they do now either, you know. So it was kind of trial and error, but yet we had more than what they had during World War II and, and Korea also, you know. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, when I got up there for body count, there wasn't just the only thing. It, it, I just liked. I would like to make sure that I had the right parts of the right body. Well, the, because the, I know if I was a parent, sure, and their son or daughter came home, you know. Now there wasn't. I can't remember doing any bodies for women, but there was some. I know. Well, if your son's name is Jim, you know, want you know want uh, part of Jim and part of Bill and part of Joe. Right. Um, how accurate were the body counts that the that the news media was uh, putting out there? Was not. The body counts was clean off. And uh, what they said we were for ours and what they said for theirs was not right. Did you take part in any counting of the enemy uh, dead? Yes, I did. And where was that? That was outside of play coup where they had a they had an overrun there and we went out there and we had to go out and of course pick their bodies up and put them over to one side and we took our bodies and took and took care of them. we left theirs in a big pile did the, did the VC or, or the North somebody Street? came and got them but I don't know they, somebody did come and get them right all right uh, so who did you report those counts to the the, the enemy I had to report them to my captain, and then the captain would port it in to the colonel, and of course it went on up to General, uh, I forgot his name. I want to say Westmoreland, but I don't think that's right. Atterbury. Westmoreland, I'm sorry, Westmoreland. <clears throat> How are, you know, what, what have I seen or heard that there was 55,000 uh, men killed over there? Uh, Fifty-seven thousand four hundred and seventy-nine. And how accurate do you think that is? I think it was more. That's why we have so many MIAs. Um, how about Agent Orange? Were you ever exposed to Agent Orange? Yes. Tell me about that. Agent Orange <coughs> was in all the waters over there, and they had a dairy over there too, like we was talking about this morning. When they used that water, all that Agent Orange was in that water. And they made milk with that. So we let alone did we get sprayed with it. You drank we it. drank it. And the water and when we took showers was from that also. Now I've been exposed once and I've had cancer once and that was back in 015. And so far I've been clean but I still got spots on me and on top of my head and stuff from Agent Orange. What, what uh, area of uh South Vietnam were you in when you were exposed? Everywhere? 
from Da Nang on over to Cambodia along the Mekong Delta and along the swampy area where it was. In fact, if you got up by Quan Tri, that was right up by the DMZ. And that was probably heavily zone. sprayed right through there. That was the DMZ, the military zone. <clears throat> so how long were you over there with the, uh, with your extension? You were over there 18 months? No. I did not. I was probably in country <clears throat> less than 14 months total. Okay. Because, like I said, I came home, went back, and then when uh, I got shot down the second time. Now, where was that? That was at Play Coup. How did That's that happen? It. We was coming in, and we unloaded our wounded to the hospital there, and then we had our dead, and we was coming back into Da Nang when we left there, and we took in sniper fire and that's when we went down the second time there and that's when I got shot up again and everybody on that time we sat on the bodies I know it sounds cruel but we did mm -hmm. because we we used them between there well, remember I told you we used our vest to sit on right that was the day afterwards and I cannot find the picture but I've got a picture from where I used to sit and I, somehow I lost my vest that I was setting on. Well, right where I was in setting, there was a big hole from underneath coming up through. So if I hadn't had my vest there, where I'd been setting on it, I would have gotten it. Oh wow! And it'd been right where I was setting at, and that and I was what they call crew chief and gunner. I was on the right side I was the one that had to go back up and check the nut up on top and all of this everything too as being crew chief and do the maintenance but I was head gunner on that ship also and that's and I had a picture of that at one time and I don't know whatever happened to it and because I, I get some of the pictures to my grandson that he took to school and yet I didn't want him to see some of the other pictures I have well now, I did have cameras over there that I had to take pictures with, but I had to give them up uh -huh. when I came home. But you did get a few out. I got a few, yes. And then, uh, <clears throat> so they brought me back. That was on Thanksgiving weekend of 1970. So when I come back, they put me in the company area is what they call a scrounge. Because I knew everything was going on, I knew I got acquainted with some of the CVs, I got acquainted with some of the Air Force and stuff, you know. And the CO says, uh, he always called me Scrounge, you know. And he didn't like to be called Sir or Saluted either, you know. Well, why is that? Well, he didn't want nobody to see being saluted because if there might be a VC there that would shoot at him, you know. Okay. So, and I was older than he was by a few years too. He says, I bent the bumper on my Jeep. Do you think you might be able to help me out? I said, well, let's see what I can do. Well, I had an old three-quarter ton that was left over from during World War II. So I was down to the shipyards seeing what I could do. And I said, I need a bumper from the old man's Jeep. He said, we don't have nothing. All we got is these brand new Jeeps that just came in off the ship and they're painted navy gray. So... Somehow, I lost my three-quarter ton, and I had a brand new navy gray Jeep. And uh -huh. I went back. back. Now, how did that happen? Well, we just did some trading. <laughs> so then we went back to the old man's place, and he says, all I wanted was a front bumper. And I said, sir, I said, all it is is it was easier to get in the whole Jeep than it was the bumper. So he gets it all painted, gets it all taken care of and everything. Well, I took his old Jeep took the bumper off, straightened it out as much as I could and put different serial numbers and stuff on it that uh -huh. wasn't even right. And that's what I run around with all the time. <laughs> and, the scrounger. Yeah. So the mess <coughs> hall, the sergeant we had for a mess sergeant, he was going to come back to Tacoma and open up a restaurant. And he was a good guy. He could cook too, but he hadn't, because we always had... Uh, powdered eggs, powdered milk, and all that stuff. And he'd make it good with the canned milk, uh, evaporated milk, whatever you gonna say. But when I got to scrounging with the CBs, I found out they couldn't get no beer. But I could get skid loads of beer. I mean, How did you get skid loads? Because we had it on the helicopters to take out to the to LZs, the... different places to leave. Okay. Well, we'd get it by the skid loads, 
and when we took ammunition stuff out, we took beer out to them too, see? So anyhow, I got acquainted with some of the guys that was bringing the beer back, and I said, you know, we can make a deal with them, and we can do what we want to do here. And he says, what do you mean? He says, I told him, I said, I know where I can get fresh milk, I know where I can get fresh eggs, I know where I can get steaks and pork chops. <laughs> I said, but I need cases of beer. Well, at that time it was PPR, Paps Boo Ribbon, okay. up there, and Stroh's mostly. <clears throat> so anyway, I would trade the beer for steaks and fresh milk and everything. And then the one uh, sailor told me, he says, hey, he says, you know, you've got to have a cooler to keep that milk in. As you know, they come in them seven-gallon cartons, them plastic containers like. Okay. So he gave me one of them, and he brought up the mess hall, and he said, you got a small mess hall here. He said, we'll have to fix it up. He says, how about if we have steak? And he talked with the, I talked with the mess sergeant, and they talked together. Well, then every Friday night, we had a cookout. <laughs> So we had steaks and pork chops every every Friday night. They made us up a grill out of steel barrels where you turn them over to get down through there and had baked potatoes. And the mess sergeant always made fresh pies, and so we had dessert. We had fresh cake because we got fresh eggs and fresh milk. That was better than being home. Yeah, so I mean, you know, we'll come find out. They wasn't even getting the fresh milk on the ships. They were getting powdered milk on the ships and powdered eggs. But this is what they were getting there, see. Uh-huh. And... By where I was, the unit I was with, you know, starting to be undercover and stuff, I found all this stuff that was going on too, so I knew what was going on and who I could deal with and who I could trust and not trust. So that's what I was doing on that. Well, this, the and then, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, no. Uh, I'd bring them up there, and, and then every Friday we had, a, we even had salads. We had fresh lettuce, everything, you know. So I didn't do nothing. I didn't have to do nothing. I just hung around the mess hall and everything. Every time the mess sergeant needed something, he'd say, hey, Scrounge, we need this. And he was, a, I believe, an E-8, and he was getting ready to get out. Now, the first sergeant we had, he was in the Navy back during the Korean War, but he didn't want his sons to go to Vietnam, so he re-enlisted back in to the Marine Corps, and he had an anchor of a tattoo of an anchor on, his, on the top of his forehead up here. And after you got to know him, you could call him Anchorhead. <laughs> but he didn't want his sons to come to Vietnam, so he re-enlisted in, back into the uh -huh. Marine Corps to stay so his sons wouldn't have to come to Vietnam for the draft. Well, what, what unit designation did you have uh, when you were in the Army? Uh, my MOS was 95 Bravo 20, which was military police, and I was stationed with the uh, once... Up at the maintenance unit, it was 169th, Company D, uh, I think it was 169th. That's what you got it's, here. Yeah, 169th, and that's with the Marical Division there at that time. Also, when I was with Horshkoff, that's with the Marical Division, but I think that was with the 173rd, uh, what they call it, where they, not detaminate, removed and stuff like this. We, remove uh, the mines? Yeah, remove the mines. It was called something else, but that's that's what they had me under. And like I said, then when I was undercover there for that 169, they just thought I was just a regular old... Just one of the guys. One of the guys. So when they had this black market stuff going on, uh, did you report any of that, or did they take you off the assignment? They just took me off the assignment. I started reporting it, and they said, you wasn't supposed to see that. What were they doing? What kind of black market stuff were they peddling? Weapons, tires, gas cans, oil, diesel fuel. Well, not so much fuel, but stuff like that. Sometimes food, uh -huh. beer, coke, well, whiskey. Uh, <clears throat> stuff that they would be in the PX, cameras, stuff like that. Well, the second time you got that. shot down, uh, uh, where did that happen? Play coup. And that was between uh, Marble Mountain and Nen Da Nang. And that was uh, sniper fire? Yes. That was taken off from it. For, for, uh, what caliber, uh, what kind of guns were they using? Were they using Russian guns? or? What? Yeah, they had uh, uh, SKSs, which is, I think, the old French gun. And then they had uh, AK-47. AR-47. AK-47. Okay, yeah. I can't remember a lot of it. As I'm getting older, I start losing my memory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I try to, I'm pretty good on names, but sometimes I can't remember everything. So how long were you uh, treated with a second injury? Just poured alcohol and bandaged up. And back out on duty? More or less, but I was, I was in the hospital for a little bit. But well, how long? Day. <laughs> Overnight. So I had to lay on my belly all night. <laughs> I can't sleep on my stomach. Yeah. Anyway. I uh, come home and my uncle says, how come you're always shot on the back side of you? And I said, because I couldn't run fast enough. <laughs> what, uh, when did you get your notice that you were coming back to the States? Christmas Day of 1970. That made a great Christmas for you, didn't yep. it? How long and I was wasn't it? supposed to come home until April 1st. How long was it between the time you got notice and the time they shipped you out? Next day, uh, December 26th. I headed back down to Chulai and OC-130. I hopped a freight there and there, and they took me down to uh, Cameron Bay, which is down way down south there at Cameron Bay. Okay. And I left Cameron <laughs> Bay, and we went into Guam. When I got on the bird at 12 midnight on the 31st of December, and I got into Guam, and we went in and, into Tokyo, I forgot we had to pick up somebody or they had to pick somebody up or we dropped somebody off. We was in Tokyo. We left there at 1 a.m. So I was in Tokyo at midnight the 31st. Then we went across the International Date Line and I was eating steak at 12 midnight on the at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. In California? In, in uh, Washington. Washington, okay. Yeah, Edwards Air Force Base at 12 midnight. Now, uh, did you have your military uniform on? At that time, yes. And... Uh, where, where did you, at Edwards Air Force Base, of course, there were no civilians there no. to greet you. Uh, how long were you at Edwards before you came on east? If we wanted <laughs> to get out right now, we could stay up and they took us out. So I got evac'd out at 3 a.m. in the morning on the 1st. On what kind of a plane? Well, we got on the bus. Now this bus has got the windows where you can't open them. Chain link fence on the windows and we're going to Tacoma Airport to get on a 747. When we get off, that's where we was getting meat with baby killers and throwing rotten eggs and tomatoes at us. Were you in uniform? Yes. Had you been told uh, while you were on the plane of what you were expecting? Yes. What was the idea of the, uh, of the wire on the windows because of people throwing things? Throwing rocks and stuff at us. And be, but they tried to get us up to the airport as close as they can, you know. To the but gate. they were still back then. They didn't have the security <laughs> like they do now, you know, at the airports with the cement barricades and stuff. But we did get on the plane. We got on a 747, and all of us was, even though it was a private plane, mm -hmm. we was all on the same jet together. Mm -hmm. Now, I had not <clears throat> slept for about 48 hours. And I can remember taking off in that 747. And next thing I know, this lady said, Sir, you can get up now. Sir, you can get up now. So I'm fast my seatbelt. I'm still there, you know, trying to drag you. Sir, you can get off the plane now. Was that O'Hare in Chicago <laughs> four and a half hours later? So, and we come in late to where we couldn't catch our flight to Dayton, me and another guy. So we're rushed across through there, and of course we're getting it from both ends. So we went to the bathroom, took our uniforms off, and put civilian clothes on, mm -hmm. and we took off across through there. And we had to get on this plane where there had to be a captain there, and and we wanted to get military standby because we wanted to come home to get out. And this captain says, "If there's no place for them, take me off and put them on." And there was somebody there at the gate saying something. No we got to take some weight off anyway, so we'll just take extra weight off, luggage or something. So we all three of us, the captain and this man, this other guy, we all got to go first class back to Dayton, <laughs> Ohio. Good. So when we got off at Dayton, <clears throat> I think that day was New Year's Day, and it was like three below zero. Oh. <laughs> and I met my son for the first time. He was three months old, I think, or five months old, something like that. Uh -huh. So that's how long I was gone the second oh, time. And well, that, that had to be kind of kind of tough uh, with getting greeted the way you were. 
then when we came home and being New Year's, you know, they still got firecrackers and everything yeah. on and this and that and stuff. My two brother-in-laws, my wife's brothers, they kind of, they wanted to see what a big boy could do underneath the couch real quick. They lit some off. Uh -huh. And I kind of went under the couch real quick when they, it was in poppers sure. or whatever you call them, you know, and the way they went off, it sounded just like enemy fire, yeah. you know, real quick, so. And you know, they tell you about watching your language and everything, and of course her parents was real Christian, strict Christians and stuff, and I don't know what it was, but when I said pass the butter, I guess I didn't say it the correct uh -huh. way or something. And out of anybody, it was her younger sister said, what'd you say? And her dad spoke up and said, he didn't say nothing. He said, pass the butter. And I didn't really know really what I did say when I said pass the butter, you uh -huh. know. So, <clears throat> anyhow. And My then, college roommate did the same thing when he went home and he caught it from yeah. his parents. And then there was times that when I when I came home, that's they were laying off from Frigidaire at that time, so I went back to some of the dealerships around here, start working around different places, you know. Now around where Franklin or and Franklin Carlisle? Middletown. I worked at a dealership for Dobler Brothers and stuff, and I worked at Heber Jones before I went in, and I worked at Beck Tower before I went in, and then I worked at some of the other dealerships, and then I drove a dump truck for a guy. Who was that? Homer Brake, which was H and B Trucking, was there no more in business right now. And uh, well, how long did it take you to get a job once you got back home? The next week. And uh, how was, much were you making an hour at that job? Well, when I got into Dobler Brothers, Mr. Do Mr. Dobler he retired, and his two sons took over. Bill and Dick took over. Well, Dick, Dick. He was over the salesman and Bill was over the maintenance area in the garage for all the mechanics and stuff. He said, I'll start you out at 5.50 an hour. He said, and if you start doing pretty good, we'll put you on flat rate like the rest of the mechanics. So I didn't think that was too bad. Yeah. And that's what he did. And Mr. Dobler, he was a big boy, big man. Well, they had me doing a little bit of everything besides mechanic work, and they were doing some other stuff, and I'm taking these cement blocks and laying them down in to fill this door up because we made a door on the other side instead of there. He says, let me show you how to do that, son. And he pushes me out of the way, and he grabs this one cement block by his one hand and sets it over and puts it down. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, gee, he was an old guy at that time. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. He was probably in his 80s, and he wow. made two of you, and he was probably about... Six nine, six eight. Oh, wow. He was a big gentleman. Or he looked taller than that to me, yeah. but I mean, you know. I said, Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, I just like that. Yeah. And we and we hit it off real good. Well, we always worked on the Weedem Weedeman trucks. Okay. The beer trucks and stuff in there. So on Saturday morning we always had a fish fry at noon. So the guy that had the trucks, he always made sure we had little kings. Okay. <laughs> with the fish fry. Uh huh. So that was our Saturday afternoon. So uh, how long did you work for Dobler? Uh, probably about nine months, from, and then I got called back to Frigidaire. Because okay. I had to report in to him saying I was home. Yep. And then I had to go back to him to keep my time because all my time for General Motors went on. Did you retire from General Motors? Yes. How long did you work there from the time you got back They home? changed over from Frigidaire to Chevrolet in 1979. And I was the next one to get laid off, and I never did get laid off, so I stayed right on until they started up with the new S10 pickups and stuff with that, and the assembly plant, and then they had the engine plant too. But I was at the assembly plant, and I was in maintenance at this time. All this time, when I went back from there, was from the service, they put me in maintenance. I was a forklift mechanic and, and operated forklifts and stuff. And that's what I ended up. So all my time went on. And I worked there up till 2001. My mother passed away in 2001, March 9th, and that's when I found out I was adopted. And I was going to retire that month, but I didn't. I stayed on till August of 01. When I retired, I liked 13 months of having 40 years with GM. Oh, and, including the time you were in service. Right, because that's including the time. And also, I was a volunteer fireman from 1968 until 02. With so who? my time went on, and that was with Franklin Township and City of Carlisle. So I was a volunteer fireman and stuff with them, and paramedic with them. So. And whenever we had a a bad 
fatality. We had at that time we had 16 or 17 railroad crossings in the this part of Carlisle area. They've closed some down, and whenever we had a fatality, the chiefs, most of the chiefs knew me or knew my follow. My follow was the chief also. I started out as a firefighter, and I I went up to as far as assistant chief, and then they put me back to a captain. But uh, every time we had a fatality, they always called me out. Because of your Vietnam experience. They thought I could handle it. Mm -hmm. And there was a few times we had some guys lay down on the tracks and tried, thought they could beat it. We had some of them pulled in front of the tracks and put it in park and stuff like that. And we had one gentleman <laughs> set down on the tracks in front of the engine. Oh, jeez. So it was, you know, plus regular accidents also. Yeah, but stuff like that really had to have an effect on the train crew, jeez. Yes. Yes. Wow. Well, how many children did you have? Three. All right. One boy, two girls. The boy will be 52 this year, I believe. No, he'll be 53. And yep. My, he was born August 21 of 70. Yes, sir. That's Robert. Yes, sir. And your next child? Be Shirley. S-H-I-R-L-E-E. -E. -E -E. Yeah. Her last name now? Is Barrett. Barrett, and she was born October seventeenth, nineteen seventy-three, at four twenty-nine a.m. <laughs> and my grandmother passed away at four thirty a.m. Oh, really? Eleven hours and fifty-nine minutes from my grandmother passing away to my wow. daughter was born. Wow! I called my parents to tell them that I've got a daughter, and they told me my grandmother passed away. Oh, shoot! Same day. Now that's that, that was good and bad. Yeah. Oh. And uh, your third child? April. She's Her last name is Kennard. She works for, for Warren County, the 911 operator, and her husband is a deputy, and his grandfather used to be the sheriff of Warren County, and I believe he's in courts right now. Uh, he's working out of the courts. He's off the road and then working in courts, but he's still with Warren County Sheriff's yeah. Department. And she was born? November. 24th, 1976 of 1976. It was the night of Thanksgiving night. <laughs> Actually, it was the next day after. So Thanksgiving would be on 25th, and, th and she was born on 26th. It was what? And now this one here, I wasn't here when Rob was, was right, born, right. but I was here when my daughter was born. Well, when I came home, the door was unlocked, and here's a note. I'm at the hospital. Mother took me. So I get down there, baby's already there, okay? So I go in, saw my daughter and stuff. Now when the third one was born, it was like 2.30 in the morning or so, and I had to go get my mother-in-law to come over and take care of the other two kids. I took my wife, and I took her down to the Middletown Hospital. I filled out the papers, and they said, well, when you get everything filled out, we'll let you go back and see your wife. So at that time, you could smoke and stuff in the hospital. So I went in the little room, I got me a coffee, got me a cigarette, lit it up. They said, you can come back and see your daughter and your wife now. <laughs> Wasn't there 22 minutes. Oh, jeez. Wasn't 22 minutes. Oh, God. That's a great story. Uh, and then, like I said, in 01, when I found out I was adopted, <laughs> if you take my step brothers and sisters, my biological step and stuff, and the ones that our biological father had remarried, I have 31 siblings, I think. We still have not found them all. Well, and we all average between 13 and 16 months apart. Oh, wow. Well, and I'm there gonna... was three of us. One, he lives in Houston. He was born in 48, so he'd be younger. He was in Vietnam at the same time I was over there. He was a sniper. And then the one we just found here in 21, 20, yeah, August of 21, he was on his second tour. He was in the Marine Corps, and he was killed over in Vietnam in 72. Mm. Mm. But he was born in Saginaw, where the rest of us was born in Flint. Flint. In Midland, Michigan. And like I said, there was, the list was too long, and I don't have all the names for all of them, because our biological dad, I was number 10 out of the... 22 and there was a set of twins uh, we always call our youngest brother baby brother I'm not the youngest Jean is she's two minutes younger we said brother <laughs> not sister so we always give him a hard time and then I've got a brother that lives over in West Virginia he grew up on the south end of Flint I grew up on the north end of Flint 
we're 26 months apart. Well, then there was a brother between us. I went to school with him, and we did not we knew we were brothers. Well, you've got some Littles. Yes. You've got Stocktons. Yes. Uh, the Littles were actually Stocktons, and that was their name changed to Little when they were adopted out. That's why there's different names on there. Now, you get down to the Raymonds, the last two, they were a Raymond, and, and that was the only two that our biological mother kept that we know of. John. And we don't know if there was twins or triplets any place in there. Of course, John we Hunt. always, you know, uh, a couple of the guys I know I hang out with there, we call ourselves the triplets because we were sitting there talking one day, and we're all Marines, all in the same area, and all have the same birthday. We had to take our yeah. driver's license out and look at each other. Yeah, I remember well, two that. of us are from Michigan. Okay. Well, uh, you got some some awards and medals when you were in. Service. I received it, yes, sir. What what uh, what I, did you I get? I received the Army Commendation Medal, which was just showing I was a uh, uh, in Vietnam, and then I received uh, uh, two bronze stars. Right. And, and, and uh, what were those for? Above and beyond the call of duty, one of them was, and of course the other one, I think they give it to me because I was the scrounge. <laughs> Does that tell you anything? Uh huh. Up and above the call of duty. Yeah. Hey, when <laughs> that's what the CO told me. When they needed something, you were able to get it for them. Yes, sir. And then uh, you had the paperwork for the Purple Heart. Yes, sir. Um, let's see. What was your rank when you uh, E5 were discharged? I was a, I was a buck sergeant out of the Marine Corps, but I was an E5 in the uh, Army, but then when I came home, I re-enlisted into the Reserves. So when I was in the, in the National Guard Reserves here in Middletown, uh, we had that tornado go through in 1974, so I was up there in that also. Mm. Okay. I think that was in April of 74. Yeah, I think so. Something like that. Uh, that's, is that something like Azenia? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you were inducted April the 1st of 69 and discharged January 1 of uh, 71. Yeah. Um, and the reason I joined the reserves because everybody got to drop out early. They'd have to go to reserves, go to summer camp, and, and you won't get paid for it. So that's why I joined the reserves. Might as well get paid for it. So I yeah. was in there for about three or four years or more. And you had to go to summer camp? Oh, yes. Two weeks in the summer? Yes, sir. Got paid for that, plus General Motors paid us our difference in our 40 hours being in reservists. I don't think there was anything else in there. Uh, I did get to meet my biological dad in August of 01, and he passed away in October of 01. Oh. And How did you meet him? I, he we lived in Saginaw, and he was married to his third wife, I believe. Well, how'd you track him down? Well, some of our other siblings had found him. So that's where I knew he was at, because I still had the property and stuff between Flint and Saginaw, where my folks and where we was raised at. And of course, my other five uh, brothers and sisters was all still living. We grew up together, six uh -huh. of us. They said, well, you might as well find out if you have any siblings or, or whatever. So. I tracked him down up in Saginaw, and I went to his house. Nobody was there, nobody was there. We kept calling, you could hear the phone ring, the door was open, you know, you could leave the doors open then. Well, I talked to the neighbor, and he said, oh, he's over with his wife, she's in the home two blocks over. So we went over there, and I told him who I was looking for and everything, and they said, yeah. Now, he used to be a real tall man, but he was kind of shrugged over a little bit. And when I walked in, he turned white as a ghost. He knew I was one of the boys, but he didn't know which, which one. one. And because he had met some of them. And we got to talking to him, and I've got a grandson, looks like him, with the blue eyes, he's tall, and talks soft real soft. Uh huh. And real soft about it. So, uh, did you have a good visit with him then? Yes. And that was the first and last time I got to see him. Yeah. That had to be 
Exciting. And that, and that lady he was married to had four or five kids, but I don't know nothing about them. Now the other lady, after he married or got divorced from our biological mother, he had what was it, six kids, I believe. They live around Midland. They said we know where you are. We know you know where we are. We need anything. Get together, and that's that's all I know. Well, here's a couple more pictures I want to show, and. Uh, This picture here. That's a graveyard. That's a grave of a South Vietnamese. And all this down around through there is military stuff. And instead of bothering the grave, they dug around the grave and left it there. Uh, were they requested to do that by the Vietnamese? Yes. Okay. Well, it was respect to the, you know, there's no cemetery. He was just buried on his property, and that's where we was at. What's in the background? That was uh, surplus stuff. There's a fire truck and some deuce and a half, mm -hmm. some tanks and trucks, pickup trucks. That's surplus stuff. What did they do with that stuff when we eventually evacuated? Did they leave all that stuff? They left it there, but it was unusable. Uh, kind of put out of commission by, right. the, by Everything was put out of side. commission. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that. That's the Air Force Base there, and, and if you look on right here on this one side right here, there's the fuel tanks. We used to take them fuel tanks and make water tanks out of them and leave them out in the hot sun, and that's how we took showers during the day from them fuel tanks. But this is the air base there at Da Nang for the Air Force. And see those uh, fuel tanks? Yeah. We just put them on posts up beside our hooch. Even though we get bullet holes in them, we get there with bubble gum and patch them but we had it fixed down to where we could take showers out of them and we'd fill them with rainwater or whatever we could get. A lot of times we took the <coughs> rainwater, come off the metal roof, we had metal roofs, and put them in them tanks and that's how we took hot showers from uh -huh. the sun. We didn't have no hot water heaters until I got up <laughs> the Nang and I got to do some scrounging. And then here's, here's a picture that's my two daughters. Place. Now which one's which? The one on the, your left, is the youngest, that's April, and me in the center cutting up, that's on my 70th birthday. And the one on the left here is Shirley. She just lives down the street here, a couple of doors, and she's the oldest girl. I don't know where my son was that day. We was off goofing off someplace. But that was over here at the Lions Club here in Carlisle. Well, what, uh what, what, what do you do most of the time in retirement? I work on some antique tractors. I got my grandfather's old tractor and I've got a couple. I'm down to three, I think, right now. One time I had like 10 or 15 of them. And I hang out with the guys on Thursday and I hang out with the guys on Monday mornings. Now let's hang let's, out with guys at the church. Well, let's, let's put a plug in for the guys on Thursday. What, what guys are you talking about? That's our social command. The Veterans it's Social veterans Command? Social Command, yes. And what's that consist of? It's Veterans Helping Veterans, and that's what we do. I believe the last time I heard, we were up to 735 people. We've had a few that has passed away, but we've got them from World War II, and we're getting some latest ones in, which is uh, Afghanistan and, and Iraq. But it's what we do, we try to help veterans get their disabilities that they get all we can do is help them we don't tell them how to do it what to do or anything like that we just tell them how to file it and what to do for it because you can do it and not get in trouble for it but the paperwork is really confusing from what I understand yes and where some of them is filed for it that helps you say like you wanted to file for it and I already have so I know what I had to go through because I've got turned down I don't know how many times till I finally got the right wording what had to be done because just like the Agent Orange when I had my cancer stuff, being on the fire department, they didn't want to do it. So I had to put it in there that I actually had the Agent Orange before that and do it. So there's, yeah. and then, so I tell you how to write it out to do it so because you can help veterans, can help veterans. Yeah. Uh, and, how about, how about uh, Barb, your wife? Uh, did she work outside the home uh, during your no. marriage at all? Maybe 
One year. Okay. So probably when I was overseas, she probably did for a little bit. Okay. Um, Mary, do you have, my wife, Mary, is our camera lady today. Mary, yeah. do you have anything you'd like to ask Lee about? No, it's really <coughs> interesting. I'm, now, I'm interested in the adoption aspect <laughs> of it. And then what you there's, did. There's a lot to it. Because mm -hmm. some of them, because they said my file was two inches thick, but they wouldn't let me look at my file on the adoption part. Mm -hmm. But they would give me, I've, like I said, I've got it out there. I've got my original birth certificate where I was born and everything mm -hmm. and stuff. Now, after we get off camera, I can tell you some other stuff. Oh, okay. okay. Not, not, not uh, public knowledge. Yeah, because I haven't found all my siblings. And yeah, they, yeah. You know. Well, is there, is there anything that we've missed uh, about your experiences well, over in Well, we used Vietnam? to get packages over there. <clears throat> We never wanted green Kool-Aid and never no bologna. <laughs> Does that tell you anything? Because the bologna always ended up being green and oh. you didn't want no green Kool-Aid <laughs> the time you got it. Oh, shoot. So that was one of the home packages we tell them. You can send anything you want, but no green Kool-Aid and no, no bologna. Well, did you communicate with your family back home uh, while you were over there? Yes, I called my wife a few times. Over there, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Here, it'd be 3 a.m. the next day. But how about your uh, stepmom and dad? Uh, did you communicate with them at yes. all? Yes. Yes, I did the uh, same thing. How and long would it take? Actually, I never did call them stepmom and dad. They were always mom and dad because I didn't even know it till one. Right. And they're the ones that raised me, so I figured that's mom and dad. Yeah. You know, that's but good. don't get don't did get you me write wrong. back and forth or at all? Oh yeah, we wrote back and forth, and I'd call and everything. We all got we got along fine. Good. We all all of us kids got well, along. How long would it take to get a letter from you back to the states? It would take longer f for them to get mine to them than it would me to get theirs. Okay. By the APO through San Francisco. Did you, did you have a regular day for mail call, or did that happen every day? Every day, sometimes, <clears throat> depending where I was at. Sometimes they'd have to track me down and then I'd get a stack of letters like that because okay. I was moving around. What, uh, in your helicopter experiences, what stands out in your mind the most? Spot. Now what's spot? All the patches we had on our helicopter oh. painted over, we called it spot. Spot. All the bullet holes. Mm-hmm. You know, and still walk away from it. Did you, uh, on all of your landings, uh, did you ever lose any crew members of sniper one fire? Time. One time. Once? Yes. Just one guy or? One guy that was with my crew and he had to be the co-pilot. Oh. The way we came down, he had to run uphill. The rest of us could run down. And of course, when you're sitting on an angle and running uphill, rotor blades are turning. Oh, really? Oh, that got him? Mm -hmm. Oh shoot! Mm -hmm. So that was one gentleman or one. Oh man, that bothered me for a while. Oh, I'm I sure. Still think about that. I'm sure because you was close to them. You wanted to keep in good touch with your pilot, co-pilot, and like I said, the one pilot I had was my first cousin's husband. So he got he he helped me fly him. He taught me how to fly him. Not supposed to, but they, uh -huh. we did. Mm -hmm. Did you, know? you ever have occasion you had to fly him? Yeah, close to it, because I got up there because the co-pilot, something, I forgot what happened. He couldn't go with us, so he had me get up in the co-pilot side, and we, we didn't go out into the field or nothing, just from one side of base to the other side oh. of the base. So I was there actually as a co-pilot, but I wasn't really okay. flying it out into Well, Lee, thank you very much for this interview, and thank you thank for you, your sir. service. Thank you, sir. And, uh, Appreciate you and your wife both. Well.